presentation is, it's about understanding opportunity. Um, and it's a piece of work that was born out of frustration, um, at which point I would like to introduce Warwick Savas from Aspect Studios. Not because Warwick was the source of, uh, of uh, frustration, but because Warwick is really the co-author um, of this piece of work that, that we've done since we were at another conference. And the conference talked a lot about big ideas, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to solve the world's problems. But they weren't, because the, uh, the ideas were great, but they were so big it was difficult to see how they were actually going to get implemented. And Warwick and I were firmly of the belief that you don't need to change the world to build better cities. And so using both kind of in-progress design work and projects that we've already delivered, we wanted to illustrate how given the right environment and the right intelligence and the will to do something correctly, it is possible to provide much better livability in our city starting tomorrow. There's two perspectives on the world on the, on the slide at the moment. On, on the left um, is kind of how the planning authorities see the private development sector. They come into office and that's what they're expecting to be confronted by. On the right is the sort of private development sector's anticipation of what the planning authorities are going to want to see. And there's an unhelpful dynamic between the two um, that generates a lot of unnecessary tension. Uh, and there are other issues. On the left is the desired. In the middle is what gets submitted. And uh, on the right is often what gets delivered. There are different agendas, and we get that. The development industry has a strong agenda. Reduced risk. It wants permit certainty. It has to perform financially, otherwise things just don't get built. They have to satisfy bank lending requirements, etc. Those are real constraints that cannot be ignored. Most of our cities have been delivered by the private development sector. That's one of those big things that we're not going to change, so we need to work with that. Good developers are interested in legacy and quality because it makes their next project better. The design for today, on the other side of the fence, the authorities also want a quality outcome. They have a very broad agenda, often involving politics. They are interested in sites beyond the specific site, in a civic contribution, and they're probably more interested in future outcomes, the design for tomorrow. Where we as designers sit is really interesting. We sit between both of those agendas, as it were, and we firmly believe, Warwick and I firmly believe that the kind of intelligence we've built in designing buildings can be transferred they're sort of consumer skills in negotiating those two agendas. So we have two parties that are prepared to negotiate, our clients and the authorities. We can be the facilitators of an outcome that actually recognizes that there are quite a lot of common areas between those two different agendas. They're not separated. There's actually a lot of meeting ground. And we can bring people together and deliver outcomes that satisfy both agendas, then we're in a win-win situation. So livability, um, I'm not going to try and define it, but I think it just broadly means a better place for human people. Okay, So for the purposes of this presentation today, we've defined it as, as public realm, um, living architecture aspect studios are leaders in delivering living architecture. And I'm going to talk inexpertly to some of these slides, but please, please speak to Warwick. Um, he's a bit of a genius on this matter, um, and he'll give you a lot more information. Uh, communal space, and also innovation and invention. So public realm, uh, I'm just going to illustrate it with four projects. And Rosie, I'm hoping you, uh, you can see there's a brighter future for Brisbane, particularly in one of these projects. Um, these are all standard development, private sector-led development projects. There's nothing unusual about the circumstances surrounding these projects. They didn't get special dispensations. We didn't have more money to spend. We just worked with our clients and the authorities to find that common ground and deliver above average outcomes. This project is in Abbotsford in Melbourne. Um, I don't know if I can find the pointer. It's a really interesting site. The northern and eastern edges are the Yarra River corridor. 
beautiful, serene environment. Victoria Street is dominated by a shopping centre and Ikea, so there's this very strong contrast in the two sites. And our work was about using the architecture as a kind of an emulsifier, as it were, so to, to meld this very sort of what we call the two speeds of life, the kind of frenetic, busy nature of Victoria Street with this beautiful uh, river corridor environment. So we developed some concept sketches that were about creating a major new public access way through the centre of the site. So this wasn't going to be private land, this was going to be open to everybody. Um, it drew the river corridor back to Victoria Street uh, and it gave a sense to people on Victoria Street where there's a large population of shoppers and office workers that there was this place, this destination they could get to. Um, our client said, well, that's great, Chris, but are you going to pay for it? So we had an eight-storey height guideline on the site. We said, no, 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 Matt, what we're going to do is we're going to take this idea to council and we're going to negotiate the eight-storey height limit. So we're going to give you your yield. We'd done an acquisition scheme that had about, let's call it, um, for want of a metric, about 450 apartments on the site. Um, we took this to the council, uh, a very constructive process. Um, I'm the first to say that, that this is one of the best town planning processes I've been involved with in the city of Yarra. Led to an outcome where 33% of the site area became public space, publicly accessible. A major new link from Victoria Street down to the river was designed as civic space, and this was an early render of that space. And that's what's been delivered. So these, these are photographs of the outcome. Um, I could spend 25 minutes talking about the design of this space in its own right, but it was very carefully curated. So the scale of the space, the architecture, very much designed to dissolve thresholds. This project is a project about thresholds. Public space should feel like public space, not a token gesture. Uh, it's really critical that you're not inhibited from walking across the site. The client very carefully curated restaurant operators, so they didn't just sell them to ever, they made sure that they got quality restaurant operators. It's become a real destination point in this part of Richmond. It's active, we put all the lobbies onto that space, and we got our 12 storeys. And in fact, we ended up with 600 apartments. Uh, but it's a fantastic place to live, and it's a great community. Um, very quickly, this is a project in Fisherman's Bend, which is a bit of a disaster um, from an urban planning perspective in Melbourne. I think I talk for more than 25 minutes about Fisherman's Bend. But here we recognise that our site was actually quite critical in the sense that Woodgate Street terminates in a kind of tram depot. We had the opportunity, we didn't have to do it, but we had the opportunity to connect Woodgate Street back into Normanby Road. So we developed and took to, took to the authorities a ground floor plan that made that connection. Uh, but our client benefits from releasing a whole stack of active frontage. And this is going to be a major new development uh, kind of area, 80,000 people, et cetera, in Melbourne. So there will be people who, who benefit from this, but also Richard, in numbers terms, we're releasing a whole amount of gross letable area on the ground floor that's going to generate income. So it's a win-win situation again. Barry Parade. Rosie, this is in, in, in Brisbane. Um, and we work very closely, um, and particularly in the subtropical kind of sense, so this is about streetscape, uh, with the council to deliver a new streetscape. So Barry Parade at the moment, this street along the bottom here, pretty average, not a great outcome. Um, major new redevelopment, um, which I'm pleased to say we've got a permit for now, um, but a large part of that was to look at the streetscape. So yes, we'll have a podium, but what can we do with the podium to make it a good place for people to live or inhabit? This is a kind of pretty basic podium, probably not dissimilar to some of the images that Rosie was showing us. We pushed it a bit harder and said, OK, how can this act as a veil for the subtropical climate? How can we make this a place where people will 
like to be where actually if we put retail on the ground floor, there's going to be a captive audience for it. Now, coming from Yorkshire and spending a lot of time in Edinburgh, the idea of shading yourself from the sun, it's a bit of a weird one for me, but apparently that's what you do in Brisbane. And um, this is our new ground floor plan. So in addition to actually greatly improving the streetscape on Barry Parade, there was an opportunity to create a new civic space in the centre of the site. And again, all of our residents in the, in, the, in the buildings above access their lobbies, not from Barry Parade, but they have to enter this civic space. So it becomes animated, becomes a busy place. Um, and this is an early render of that space. Uh, and taking on board exactly some of the principles Rosie was talking about, using the vegetation, and filtering light and creating a space. But I kind of quite like to go and sit there. The only thing missing from this render is the people. Um, we believe it'll be a really successful small scale. It's not enormous. It's not, it's not a major new civic space. But it's a civic space that'll be occupied. The retail tenancies feed off it. Um, it'll add value. And it'll add value in the sense that Richard was talking about. So the Abbotsford project, because of the quality of what we were doing there, Added value to the apartment sales, good example. Now, this is where I'm a little bit out of my depth and Warwick needs to speak to this, but really this is about, you need to put in the correct infrastructure. So, so people like, we, we sort of acknowledged, and it's talked about a lot, that people like green. Well, this is how you deliver it. You can't just put in a little palm tree and think that you've done the job. You actually need to build in the infrastructure. Uh, and that can be quite technical and it can be quite innovative as well. So there is research that Aspect Studios are doing about how we provide living architecture on buildings in a meaningful way that doesn't impose a big cost penalty on buildings. So it's entirely possible to do this now without imposing an enormous cost to the owners' corporation. This particular slide talks to streetscapes and podiums. Uh, communal space. So this is kind of about resident space within a development. So this is slightly dislocated from the public realm. It's a different discussion, looking at how we achieve that. A couple of the projects, three of the projects are, are back up. This is the Abbotsford project. There's always one slide that ends in upside down. This makes me a bit sick looking at this. Um, this, is our, this is Acacia Place, so our new route through the site. These, these are our buildings. And then what I want to talk about here are actually the communal spaces, lobbies. We see residential lobbies as communal space. They are not a post box, okay? They're a place that we design to slow people down. We've heard a lot about the bump factor in commercial workspace uh, in the plenary session this morning. Lobbies are the same. Lobbies in residential play in buildings should be places where people stop and talk to each other and get to know their, get to know their neighbors. So these are generous but they're also designed with places where people can sit. So you don't feel, they're not transient spaces that you kind of run through, because you just want to get out of there. These are places where you slow down, meet your neighbors. Interestingly here, part of your owner's court fee pays for the bar. And every Friday night or every second Friday night, the bar gets opened. And the owner's court gives out your drink to the residents. Now being humans, People want to get value for money for their uh, owner's corp fees. So guess what? These places are full of residents. Rooftops, again, above and beyond um, what's required or what's regulated. Really good quality spaces, and particularly as workplaces become more flexible. These are workplaces. If I go up there during the weekday, there'll be five or six people working from home, but not working from their apartment. They'll be working with other people in these, in these rooftop spaces. Well, geez, that's going to cost more, Chris. Owners' court fees are going to go up. Guess what? These spaces are so nice that people rent them for weddings, for 50ths, on a restricted basis, so that they're actually generating up to $30,000 a year for the owners' court which keeps the fees down, so you're not paying above and beyond. So it's just smart and intelligent use. Um, Norman B, so we wanted to look at you know, high rise. This is 40 stories. 
how we create meaningful communal space in a high rise. So we kind of exploded it and we're having a discussion with the authorities at the moment because each of these communal spaces is nine metres tall. And the problem with Fisherman's Bend is we have a mandatory height limit of 40 storeys. Now mandatory height limits, whole other discussion, are really problematic because it doesn't allow this negotiation. So at the moment we're trying to argue that nine metres is a single storey. Because it is, we haven't got any more yield, we haven't stuffed more apartments in, we've just kind of exploded and pulled the building apart where we have these communal spaces. Fantastic spaces, different, different kinds, playground, sun deck, winter summer gardens, park lawns, gar um, Mediterranean gardens where residents can grow food. Jeez, Chris, how are we gonna pay for this? Common theme. Here we go. Um, as well as helping, obviously, with the architectural articulation, we wanted these communal spaces to engage with the city as much as they could. Sistine Chapel inspired us, a bit literal, um, but public art on the soffits. How are we going to pay for it? We're going to pay for it with wind. Now, that might sound a bit odd, but they're not randomly placed. These communal spaces have a dramatic impact on the wind forces on this building. They play an enormously important role in mitigating how much structure we need to build to make this building stand up. And this is, I think, a really good example of where design intelligence can deliver an outcome that satisfies both agendas. So we're bringing in, who would have thought I would have said wind is the answer to paying for it? But we're producing a building where we have to pay significantly less for the structure in order to deliver significantly more communal space than we necessarily would have to. Um, habitat, a built example along similar themes. So this is on a really tough site. Um, this is a freeway, really noisy. It sits on the southern edge of Melbourne CBD. So it's kind of exposed to our southwesterly winds. It's pretty unpleasant, pretty unpleasant environment. Um, we responded to it um, by saying, okay, look, putting terraces. So we were supposed to provide eight square meters of terrace for every apartment. Putting terraces on this building, not a fantastic idea because all they're gonna do is suck your cat off. It's not a great place to leave your cat because it won't be there when you come home. What we did, and the economics behind this were to say, okay, we're going to take every individual terrace, we're going to agglomerate it into a single shared communal space. So I don't know very good at maths, but five times eight is 40, Phil, is that right? You're an engineer. Um, and we're providing about 48 square metres of space, so it sort of adds up, you know, giving away that space. It means the apartments have these fantastic full height um, windows, um, and then the communal gardens, they're shared, find the right button, 15 apartments share each communal garden. So it's building community. Okay, I get to know my neighbours because I have exclusive access along with 15 other owners or 14 other owners to this, to this little garden and then the economics stack up. And that's the built result. Um, it's an example though of where uh, and we're open about this, mandating an outcome for the landscaping should have been a stronger part of the permit, because that didn't really happen. So we needed Warwick on this project, but he wasn't. Um, very briefly, this is just to illustrate that you can build sky gardens. That it's not rocket science. Um, and we can do vertical green facades. So one central park, people in Sydney would know very well, Warwick knows very well. Uh, and Rosie, this is a project we've completed in Brisbane, Botanica, where we've really taken an interest in addressing the street. And it's transferable into commercial projects as well. So this is a commercial project we have on the boards at the moment in Melbourne. Bit of a B-grade location. Um, but, you know, we seem to be on trend based on this morning's discussion. Um, so looking at kind of more of a horizontal outcome. We've got a pretty complex town planning envelope here. 
which means we have to produce this kind of cascaded building. Well, let's take advantage of the fact that this building cascades by putting the communal space on those outdoor decks. Um, there's a lot to this building. Also, big picture windows. So communal, well, the kind of atriums on the edge of the building rather than internal. We're not big fans of atriums within a building. We think kind of atriums work better when they're on the external facade of a building. And all of these windows are, are kind of conveniently orientated to key views in Melbourne. So this one looks back to the Shrine of Remembrance, for instance. Um, and communal space is interdispersed. So there isn't one big facility. It's kind of at each level, local. Every floor plate's different. Um, Living architecture, and this is really kind of Warwick's area of expertise and not mine. I couldn't grow a tomato plant in a rainforest. But um, it's entirely feasible. It doesn't impose ridiculous costs on your owner's corp. We can do it. It produces places that people like to, like to be, like to live. It adds value. So all of these projects that we're showing you, um, another part, you know, and, and Richard would be interested in this, they sell for more, duh. People like it, therefore you can afford to do more. But you've got to be brave. You've got to take that leap as a client and say, okay, I'm going to produce something of real quality because people are going to appreciate it. And they do. So there's value in doing things well. This is back to Acacia Place, just looking at the, you know, don't just put in a token palm tree. If you're going to do landscape, do landscape properly, please. Um, and this is well beyond me. So this is research, um, looking at the various methods. So it, you don't have to do a green facade in Brisbane. You can do green facades in Melbourne. You just have to kind of get the infrastructure right, use the right species of plant, um, and it works. Roof terraces, so you, know, you don't need to necessarily put 500 millimetres of deep soil and pay a structural cost. There are systems now that work where 150 millimetres of soil with the right technology gives these results. Um, I'm going to finish just in time on a just kind of further exploration of innovation and kind of uh, cheekiness, I guess. This, um, this project here. Uh, in, in New South Wales, in Sydney, and we discovered that the uh, floor space ratio meant we could exclude corridors if they weren't enclosed. So we thought, oh yeah, there's an interesting idea. We'll open all the corridors to the external environment. It means we get a couple more apartments in the project, but it means if all, we can afford to produce a development where the corridors are single, single loaded. Now typically for a development to work you've got to be pretty efficient with the use of circulation space but because this circulation space doesn't count in our floor space ratio we can put more apartments in and make this concept work. Now the last thing we need and apologies is there anyone from the, the planning authorities here, is for someone to try and close that loophole because it's actually delivering a really quality result. Um, and this is just a, an early render of the interaction between those open corridors, landscape again in that courtyard, meaningful landscape as a place to live, naturally ventilated apartments, entirely within the constraints of your typical private sector development project. Um, and this is an idea we're working on at the moment, um, which is kind of okay, Airbnb. Airbnb is a big issue in um, higher density apartment buildings because you know, there's one down the road from me in Melbourne that's got a really bad rap because you know, half the building's been used for Airbnb. Our concept here is that the owner corp, so the owner's corp owns the Airbnb apartments. So there is that short stay accommodation available. So friends come to stay, you can rent one of these Airbnbs from the owner corp. All of the people in the building benefit because at some point 
they're going to generate income from, from the ownership of that Airbnb back through the owner's corp. Maybe the owner's corp sells it in 10 years' time and they kind of bail out, who knows, because Airbnb's been disrupted by something else and it's no longer the place to stay. Um, and finally, what we're building, um, these are a bit dumb, these diagrams at the moment, but is a kind of white paper to, to illustrate to all of these various stakeholders that kind of those early agendas don't have to fight each other. That if you have the right catalyst, if you work together, there's an outcome that delivers a better city and a better outcome for the development industry. I'm going to stop there. I've talked enough. Thank you.